This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to see you all this evening. I'm Dr. Leonard Wallach with the Taubman Symposia in Jewish Studies here at UCSB. Nine times a year, the Taubman Symposia presents free public events which feature internationally renowned writers, artists, critics, filmmakers, political leaders, and social activists from all over, from Israel, from Europe, from the United States. And this fall has been an especially exciting one for us. We've hosted visits to our campus and community by novelist and Bible scholar Maggie Anton, former US ambassador to Israel, Martin Indyk, and tonight, chief rabbi of the United Hebrew Congregations of the Commonwealth and an enormously prolific author, Jonathan Sachs. These remarkable events have been made possible through the generous support of the Herman P. and Sophia Taubman Foundation, but they've also received funding from members of the Jewish community, as well as nonprofits who serve as co-sponsors of this series. Their names are listed in the program that you were handed at the door, and I want to express our deepest gratitude to all of them for their critical role in maintaining the excellence of the symposium. Since tonight's event will be videotaped for broadcast on UC television, I would like to ask that you please turn off anything in your possession that beeps. Anything. And now it's my great pleasure to invite Rabbi Steve Cohen of Congregation B'nai B'rith, who's one of the original members of the Taubman Symposia Program Committee, to introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. There have been many times in Jewish history when Jews lived in isolation from the rest of the world, in shtetls or in ghettos, and had little or no interaction with the non-Jewish culture and people around us. This is not one of those times. In this day and age, we Jews are in constant contact with our non-Jewish neighbors, co-workers, and friends, and also with the best books, the best ideas, and the best thinkers in the world. And in a time like this, if we are going to live as complete, educated Jewish human beings, we need teachers who are steeped in both Judaism and the best of non-Jewish learning. We require teachers who know and authentically represent and embody the very best of Torah, and who also understand and embrace the very best wisdom of the world around us. It takes an extraordinary mind to be steeped in both Torah and the wisdom of the world. In any generation, there are never more than just a few. Tonight, it is my very great honor to introduce to you one of the greatest teachers for our generation, Chief Rabbi, Lord Jonathan Sachs, who will be speaking on the topic, the future of Judaism. After Rabbi Sachs's presentation, there will be a question and answer period. And, and courtesy of the book den, there are copies of Rabbi Sachs's books, Future Tense, 
Jews, Judaism, and Israel in the 21st century, and also the great partnership, God, Science, and the Search for Meaning. They will be available for purchase and for signing after the event. After the lecture and question and answer concludes, those wishing their copies signed may line up along the left side of the auditorium, and the chief rabbi will be seated at a table on this stage of Campbell Hall to sign your, your copies. Again, please welcome Chief Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs. Friends, it's uh, really wonderful to be with you in this wonderful university um, situated in what must be the best kept secret in the United States because I can't believe anyone who actually knows what Santa Barbara is like would not wish to be here permanently. So you are truly fortunate and blessed to be here. And blessed uh, indeed uh, to have uh, this wonderful program of the Herman and Sophia Taubman Foundation and Dr. Leonard Wallach, who is such a very, very special human being. And it's just great to be with you. Friends, uh, you have managed, certainly in the Jewish community here in, in Santa Barbara, um, something over which clearly one has to make a bracha overseeing a miracle. You managed to get all bits of the community to be quite nice to each other. <laughs> How did you manage that? Uh, we just read last Shabbat in Shul, the parsha of Vayetze, that wonderful moment when Jacob fleeing from home, finds himself alone at the dead of night, lies down, has a dream of a ladder stretching from earth to heaven with angels ascending and descending. And he wakes up and says, This must be a shul. This is a house of God. And this is the gateway to heaven. And the rabbis ask, how did he know this place was the house of God? And they give the following answer that when Jacob lay down to sleep, he took a number of stones to rest his head on, and the stones started arguing, I want him to rest on me. And in the morning when Jacob woke up and said, if the, even the stones are arguing with one another, this must be a shoe. <laughs> so by defying all probability, may I say that you have created a wonderful precedent that I hope is imitated by many other communities. It's a privilege to be with you. I've been asked to say a few words this evening about uh, the Jewish future, the future of Judaism. And I think attempting an answer would probably be unwise. I was together with uh, one of the world's great experts on Islam, Professor Bernard Lewis, when 10 years ago somebody asked him to predict the future of the Middle East. And he gave the following reply. He said, I am a historian, therefore I only ever make predictions about the past. What is more, he said, I am a retired historian, so even my past is passé. However, I am mindful of the fact that once I was standing, officiating at a wedding, and I said to the young couple, we seem to know so much these days. We have photographed the birth of galaxies. We have decoded the human genome. Is there anything left? Is there one undiscovered country left? And I said, there is. The one undiscovered country is called the future. We may know everything there is to be known. We do not know and will never know what tomorrow may bring. The day I gave that speech under the chuppah was the 8th of September, 2001. So uh, we never know what the future will bring. I can, however, say with some precision what problems we will have to overcome if there is to be a Jewish future. And they are threefold. Number one, and I am very, very sad to have to say so, there is the phenomenon, especially in Europe, but globally of anti-Semitism within living memory of the Holocaust. I call this, and it is generally called, the new anti-Semitism. Because in some respects it is like, and in some respects unlike, the old anti-Semitism. 
And therefore, to explain what is new about it, we have to understand what anti-Semitism is. Anti-Semitism is not a coherent set of ideas. In the 19th century, Jews were hated because they were poor and because they were rich, because they were communists and because they were capitalists, because they kept entirely to themselves, because they infiltrated everything and got everywhere. They were hated because they believed in a superstitious ancient faith, and they were hated because they were rootless cosmopolitans who believed nothing. Anti-Semitism is a series of contradictions in terms. How then shall we understand anti-Semitism? And I think the best analogy is to say that it is a virus. And a virus infects the body politic just as other kinds of virus infect the human body. Now the human body has the most sophisticated defense mechanism in the whole of biology to counter viruses. It's called the human immune system. How then do viruses survive and succeed? The answer is they mutate. And that is what anti-Semitism does. It mutates. And what makes the new anti-Semitism different from the old is three things. Number one, the old anti-Semitism was directed against Jews as individuals. Today, the new anti-Semitism is directed against Jews as a nation in their own land. Amos Oz, the Israeli novelist, said in the 1930s, anti-Semites used to shout, Jews to Palestine. Now they shout, Jews out of Palestine. He said, they don't want us to be here. They don't want us to be there. They don't want us to be. Secondly, the epicenter of the old anti-Semitism was, of course, in Europe. Today, it's in the Middle East, but it is spread globally by the new communications media. And third, and this is harder to explain, it is actually, and always has been, very difficult to publicly justify hating a group of people. And therefore, anti-Semitism has always had to validate itself by the most prestigious source of authority available within a culture at any one time. In the Middle Ages, what was the most prestigious source of authority? The church, the religion. And that is why in the Middle Ages, um, anti-Judaism, uh, hostility to Jews was religious anti-Judaism. In the 19th century, in post-Enlightenment Europe, religion was no longer the most prestigious source of authority. What was the most prestigious? The answer was science. And therefore, it flourished on the basis of two disciplines which today we would not remotely call science, but were thought to be so at the time. The first was the so-called scientific study of race, and the second was a phenomenon known as social Darwinism, represented in the English-speaking world by Herbert Spencer, in, the, in Germany by somebody called Ernst Haeckel. And they held that a law operates in history just as it does in biology, that the stronger races eliminate the weaker ones. And thus, religious anti-Judaism mutated into racial anti-Semitism a much, much more serious phenomenon, since you can change your religion, but you can't change your race. In the Middle Ages, people could work for the conversion of Jews, but in the modern age, they could only work, God forbid, for the elimination of the Jews. Today, science is no longer the most prestigious source of authority, because science has given us the capacity to destroy life on Earth. So ever since World War II and the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the most supreme source of authority has been human rights. And that is why at the United Nations Conference Against Racism held in Durban in the summer of 2001, Israel was accused of the five cardinal sins against human rights. Racism, apartheid, ethnic cleansing, attempted genocide, and crimes against humanity. And 
One obvious consequence of the new instantaneous global media is that today, a conflict anywhere becomes a conflict everywhere. And that has made life very fraught for Jews, especially in Europe. So that is number one issue that has to be overcome. Number two, obviously, though not in Santa Barbara, but everywhere else I know, is intra-Jewish relations. I made a joke about stones quarreling, but the truth is divisions among Jews are really no joke at all. Let us put the matter in context. In 4,000 years of history, Jews have gone into exile how many times? Three, yeah? In the days of Joseph, the time of the Babylonian exile, and then again, when the Romans destroyed the Second Temple in the year 70, when they defeated the Bar Kokhba Rebellion in 135. And each time, for the same reason, which was the inability of brothers and sisters to live peaceably together. The first exile happened because the brothers of Joseph hated him, sought to kill him, eventually sold him into Egypt as a slave. The second occurred because after only three generations of kings, Saul, David, Solomon, the kingdom split into two, and already tiny, having split into two, the end was inevitable. And number three, in the days of the late Second Temple period, as we know from Josephus, when Vespasian and Titus were besieging Jerusalem, the Jews inside were more intent on fighting one another than fighting the Romans outside. Now, if you think about it, there is an extraordinary fact about Jewish history. Jews have been assaulted by some of the greatest empires the world has ever known, by Egypt of the pharaohs, by Assyria, by Babylon, by the Alexandrian Empire, by the Roman Empire, by the medieval empires of Christianity and Islam, all the way through to, in the 20th century, the Third Reich and Soviet communism. Every one of those empires, seemingly impregnable at the time, every one of which bestrode the narrow world like a colossus, has been consigned to history. And Jews, that tiny people, can still stand and sing, Am Yisrael Chai. It follows that there is only one people capable of endangering the future of the Jewish people, and that is the Jewish people. So that is the second challenge. How do we live with our own differences? However, those two problems are relatively minor compared to the third and fundamental challenge, Jewish continuity itself. We're losing Jews. Take the United Kingdom. In 1945, there were something like 450,000 Jews in Britain. By the time I became chief rabbi, <laughs> long ago in the Jurassic Age, no, I mean, it was only 21 years ago, but by then, already only 300,000. And the same is true of almost every country in the diaspora. How do you persuade young Jews to want to be Jews? There was a great rabbi who spent his time going around university campuses singing called Rabbi Shlomo Kalbach. You've heard of him. You've all sung his tunes. Uh, don't, no, I'm not going to conduct you in Geshet Zamod right now. Uh, he used to say the following. I go around campuses. I ask kids, what are you? And if somebody gets up and says, I'm a Protestant, I know that's a Protestant. If they say, I'm a Catholic, I know that's a Catholic. If they say, I'm just a human being, I know that's a Jew. <laughs> now, that is a problem because... There is a fundamental difference between Jewish life in pre-modern times and Jewish life now. In pre-modern times, Jews stayed Jews because what else was there to be? I'm Jewish because my parents were Jewish, my grandparents were Jewish, because that's what I am. But in, these day, in those days, before the American Revolution, which we really won't talk about right now, um, in 1776 and the French Revolution in 1789, there was no secular state. There was no neutral space. You were either Jewish or Christian or Muslim. So abandoning your faith meant converting to another faith, and by and large, Jews didn't do that. Except in 15th century Spain, by and large, they didn't. Today, you can leave the Jewish community without becoming anything in particular. As sociologists say, 
Modernity is the move from fate to choice. And that is what Jewish identity has become, not just a fate, but a choice. How then do you sustain Jewish identity in an open and secular and highly diverse society? Those, I think, are the three major challenges, external relations, internal relations, and Jewish continuity. And I want to speak very personally, just to talk about how we decided to confront these problems in Britain. And here, I took a very unusual decision. You know, the Talmud calls Jews an Amar Paziza, an impetuous nation. Have you ever seen a Jewish queue? And it's forbidden in Jewish law because it's the next stage you, to complete assimilation. So, uh, why are we called an Amar Paziza? Because at Mount Sinai we said, Naaseh Nishma. We took a decision to act, and only then did we take a decision to try and understand what we were doing. Now, when you are in the presence of God himself at Mount Sinai, that is a reasonable thing to do, but at other times it's not necessarily so. And yet, too often, as a Jewish community and as a Jewish people, first we act and only then do we think. And that is not a great strategy. So although uh, I have an official position as a religious leader, I took a decision that we had to think each problem through before we decided what to do. So um, in each case, we tried to read and think and debate and teach. And in each case, I even wrote a book before starting on our programs because I believe that we need to know where we're going. Incidentally, my mentor in this, one of my greatest personal tutors, was um, about 10 years ago when I got a car with a satellite navigation system. Do you have those uh, here? <laughs> it's a wonderful thing, you know. You key, key in your destination and, and this thing tells you exactly what to do. The only trouble, as soon as I saw this satellite navigation system and worked out how it worked, I realized that whoever designed this thing had never in their lives met a Jewish driver. <laughs> you know, you key in your destination and a very polite lady's voice says, you travel straight 300 yards and turn left. And you know every Jewish driver says, what does she know? I've lived here for 50 years. I know you travel 300 yards and you turn right. And what the m computer does when it just does what you asked it to do and then you completely ignore its instructions has been a great moral lesson to me. <laughs> First of all, it never loses its cool. You know, it's just chills, you know. Does nothing for a while. Then it sent up a signal saying recalculating the route. And then lo and behold, it tells you how to get from this ridiculous place that you, the Shlemiel, have got lost in, how to get to where you want to be. So from this, I learned a fundamental lesson in life, which is so long as you know where you're supposed to be going to, then however lost you are, there is a route from here to there. And if that isn't a basis of hope, I don't know what is. But first, you have to think through your destination. And therefore, on each of these three questions, I ask the question not what or how, but why. And I ask the fundamental question because I felt with all these issues, we have to go back to absolute basics and ask the question, why are we Jews? And I just want to take you through the journey of thought that I traveled in order to know how best to respond to the three challenges. And let me give you specifically the starting point, the source of all the problematics. And here it is. Judaism has a feature that is unique to it. It is not shared by the other Abrahamic monotheisms, Christianity and Islam. Judaism is a particularist monotheism. What does this mean? It means that we believe that the God of Israel is the God of all humanity, but the religion of Israel is not the religion of all humanity. Why not? And that led me to a fundamental 
paradigm shift in the way we think about the relationship between Jews, Judaism, and the world. And I want you to come with me down this extraordinary intellectual journey. You see, what struck me immediately is when you read the Bible, the Torah is about the Jewish people, but it does not begin with the Jewish people. It begins with all humanity. That statement in Genesis 1 that every human being, regardless of color, culture, or creed, is in the image of God. And then it proceeds through four stories that talk about humanity as a whole, Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, Noah and the flood, Babel and its builders. And only then, in Genesis chapter 12, do we hear the words that set Jewish history into motion. Leave your home, your birthplace and your father's house and go to the land which I will show you why. Why at that point does the Torah narrow its focus from all humanity down to one man, one woman, Abraham and Sarah, and their descendants who eventually become one nation, Goya Chadbar? It's, it is a very, very strange phenomenon. There is a second strange phenomenon, which is this. Judaism begins with two great journeys, Abraham and Sarah's from Mesopotamia, and later, Moses and the Israelites from Egypt. What makes those odd journeys? Let me ask you. Normally, where is the movement of populations? From poor countries to rich or from rich to poor? From poor to rich. Is the movement from low civilization to high civilization or from high civilization to low civilization? Always from low to high. Those two Jewish journeys were in exactly the opposite direction. The great civilization of Abraham's day was Mesopotamia, the Tower of Babel that really was there. This was the place where writing was invented, cuneiform, where the wheel was invented, where human beings first mapped the heavens, developed astronomy, developed the calendar, and yet Abraham leaves that high civilization. In Moses' day, several centuries later, the supreme civilization of its time was Egypt of the pharaohs, and never did it reach a higher apex than in the days of Pharaoh Ramses II, thought by many scholars to be the pharaoh of the Exodus. So, this is very odd. And I suddenly realized that Judaism was born as a protest, as a protest movement. A protest against empires and imperialism. And I can define imperialism much as I would today define fundamentalism as the attempt to impose a single truth on a plural world. It is clear, reading the Torah's account of creation, that the miracle of monotheism is that unity in heaven creates diversity down here on earth. God doesn't create one form of life. He creates three million forms of life. God doesn't create one language and culture, but a rich profusion of them. And that was when I realized that if the Jewish story begins in Genesis 12, then we have to take a magnifying glass Genesis 10 and 11, to understand what went wrong such that the solution was Abraham and the birth of Judaism. And no sooner do you look at Genesis 10 and 11 than you see something that you never saw before. I want you to listen to how Genesis 11, the story of the Tower of Babel, begins. It begins with these words. The whole world, the whole earth, the whole land, sorry, the whole land was of one language and a shared vocabulary. And we have always read that as a picture of harmony. However, if you actually go back, and I hope after the lecture you'll take a look at this, and look at the previous chapter, chapter 10, you will see that in chapter 10, God had already divided humanity into 70 languages. So how was it 
But one chapter later, the people on the plane in Shinar speak only one language. And it is only thanks to archaeology that we are able to decipher the mystery. The world's first emperor, Sargon I, of Assyria, or what is today known as Akkadia, almost certainly the figure the Bible calls Nimrod. We know from ancient inscriptions that Sargon I boasted of his imperial conquests, and he says that he imposed his language on all the countries he conquered. In other words, the apparently idyllic scene in Genesis 11, with everyone speaking the same language, turns out not to be an idyll at all. It is the story of a ruthless conquest of cultural imperialism, of the use of power to suppress the powerless and wipe out local cultures in the name of the imperial culture. We know this as well. That both Mesopotamia that Abraham left and the Egypt that Moses left were deeply hierarchical societies. And they actually epitomized this hierarchy in their monumental architecture. Remember the shape of a Mesopotamian ziggurat, of which Babel was one, the biggest actually of the 32 thus far discovered. And of course, um, the Egyptian pyramids, the pyramid, Great Pyramid of Giza, already some seven, many centuries old, over a thousand years old by the time of Moses, and the world's tallest man-made structure until 1889 when the Eiffel Tower was built. Both of these buildings were narrow at the top, broad at the base, to signify this one ruler at the top resting on the mass of humanity on the bottom, whose only job was to support that narrow base, at the, that narrow peak at the top, the many serving the few. And the second you understand that, you go back and realize the words of Genesis 1, that God made mankind in his image, turn out to have a completely different meaning than we thought they had. We thought it meant, what a miracle, what a miracle that there are human beings in the image of God. That turns out not to be the interesting thing about that line at all. Everyone in the ancient world thought there were human beings in the image of God. Who were they? The king or the pharaoh. Mesopotamian kings of Mesopotamian city-states were always the chief intermediaries of the gods. The pharaohs of Egypt were demigods themselves, none more so than Ramses. The very word Ramses is a compound of two words. Incidentally, one of them is the same as Moses, Messes. You know what Messes means in Egyptian? Ancient Egyptian, it means child. What does the Ra mean? The Egyptian sun god. So Ramses is the child of the sun god, whereas Moses is just an anonymous child. So the idea that they are human beings in God's image was commonplace. What Genesis 1 is telling us is not that there are some human beings in God's image, but that every one of us is. That was the revolutionary statement, the most revolutionary statement ever uttered in human history. So Judaism is a protest against empires. It's a protest against hierarchy. It is a protest against the rule of power and the sovereignty of might. In the name of diversity, human dignity, and the sovereignty of right. How did God register this protest? By calling on one man, Abraham, and telling him, you be different. Leave all the forces that make human beings conform. Leave your land, leave your birthplace, leave your father's house, and go and be different. Why? In order to teach all humanity the dignity of difference. And of course you'll say, but we're all different. What made Abraham differently different? And the answer is yes, we are all different. But through the long course of history, only Jews have insisted on the right to be different, on the duty to be different, on the dignity of difference. Throughout all of human history, only Jews consistently refused 
to assimilate to the dominant culture or convert to the dominant faith. Throughout history, Jews have been a small nation to give hope to all small nations, to tell the world you don't need to be large to be great or powerful to have influence. Jews have often been a minority to give hope to all minorities that you can make an impact out of all proportion to your numbers. This insight allowed me finally to understand anti-Semitism. What is anti-Semitism? Listen to the words of the world's first anti-Semite, Haman, in the book of Esther. Yeshno am echad mufuzah mufarad ben ha'amim v'datehem shonot mikol am. There is one people dispersed and scattered among the nations whose laws are different from all other nations. Anti-Semitism is dislike of the unlike. It is fear and hatred of difference. But difference is what makes each of us human. Because we're all unique, therefore, each one of us is irreplaceable. It follows that a society that has no room for Jews has no room for humanity. Anti-Semitism matters to humanity because although it begins with Jews, it never ends with Jews. And so, talking in this way, we were able to get non-Jews to see that anti-Semitism concerns them, not just us. And that has been fundamental to our approach in Britain about anti-Semitism. In 2003, we were able to persuade the European Union under Romano Prodi to hold the European Conference, the first of its kind, on anti-Semitism in Brussels at the European Union headquarters. And I spoke there and I said these words, Jews cannot fight anti-Semitism alone. The victim cannot cure the crime. The hated cannot cure the hate. I will fight for the right of Christians anywhere in the world to live their faith without fear, but I need you Christians to fight for the right of Jews to live their faith without fear. In Britain, I lead the fight against Islamophobia, but I need you Muslims to lead the fight against Judeophobia. And so Britain became the first country where the fight against anti-Semitism is led by non-Jews, by a parliamentary body consisting of all parties, led by the prime minister, all prime ministers since then, Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, David Cameron. And we have created several organizations of Jews and Muslims fighting anti-Semitism and Islamophobia together. And that is a very important way of confronting anti-Semitism in the 21st century. I then took this idea of the dignity of difference, just in general, to non-Jews. And it had an extraordinary effect. Every year, Elaine and I give a reception for the leaders of the National Union of Students. Not for the Union of Jewish Students, they come as well. But because there's a lot of anti-Jewish and anti-Israel activity on British campuses, we feel that we have to have the leadership of the National Union of Students, or all, all non-Jews, on our side. So we hold a reception for them each summer. And for an hour before the reception, I sit and learn we have a share together with the leadership of the National Union of Students. And for two years, I road tested this idea of the dignity of difference. And I suddenly saw these students walking out of that room, Sikhs, Hindus, people from the Caribbean and others, walking a little bit taller. And I could see them thinking, hang on, we always knew we were different. 
But we always thought that was bad. Now the chief rabbi is telling us it's good. So they felt good about it. And it had an extraordinary effect on all of them. A, a little group of Muslims in the city of London asked me to become, stop being chief rabbi and become chief imam. <laughs> I told them I have enough sorrows already. Um, <laughs> London University students, non-Jewish students, were kind enough. They have a union building. It's their sort of center, a social center of the non-Jewish students to put just by the front door as you, on the wall, a plaque with a quotation from my book, The Dignity of Difference, which reads, we are all different, therefore each of us has something unique to contribute. And because of that, we were able to take a Jewish message and share it with non-Jews and discover that they found that empowering for them. And that's very important. Coming to the second pr problem, within the Jewish community itself. Well, do we have space for dignity of difference there? Well, you know, that's a little more difficult. Um, and I have to say that there was a time 15, 20 years ago when relations between Orthodox, conservative, reformed Jews in Britain were sometimes very tense. And I said to myself, if we are going to have to address the differences between Jews and others, surely we have to address the differences between Jews and Jews. And therefore, I formulated two principles which we have used ever since, and they work. I don't know if they would work in America, but they work in Britain. The two principles are these. On all matters that affect us as Jews, regardless of our religious differences, we work together regardless of our religious differences. And so we work together, Orthodox, Conservative, Reform, Secular, on welfare, on defense, on Israel, on interfaith, the fight against anti-Semitism, and all the things that affect us regardless. And the second principle is that on all matters that touch on our religious differences, we agree to differ, but with respect. These two principles have helped us to reduce almost to zero the tensions within the community, and they've allowed us to apply the dignity of difference inside as well. Finally, Jewish continuity. Well, there are many things we did to enhance Jewish continuity in Britain, but one of them was this. I had to walk the talk. If we were talking about the dignity of difference, then we had to show that you could speak with a distinctive Jewish voice and yet be at the very heart of society, at the very heart of its public conversations. So I began doing a lot of broadcasting, radio, television, writing in the national press. Eight of my books have been serialized in the national press. And it had strange effects. Number one, I do much better among the non-Jews than the Jews. That's, that's, that was great. Secondly, a strange thing began to happen. You know, I, you know, a rabbi can reach the Jews who come to synagogue, but how can, how can you reach the Jews who never come to synagogue? Well, something rather interesting happened, you know. Uh, because I do a lot of broadcasting, a non-Jew would come into his office and say to his Jewish neighbor, you know, I heard your chief rabbi on the radio this morning. He's quite good, isn't he? So we turned the whole of the British public into outreach workers for Judaism. <laughs> And uh, it's absolutely extraordinary what happens. So for instance, just to give you one little episode that happened 10 years ago, May 2002, the Queen has just celebrated her Diamond Jubilee. Then she was celebrating her Golden Jubilee and gave her a reception in Buckingham Palace for all the face. Now, I don't know if you remember what was happening in May 2002. This was Janine. This was a very bad moment in Jewish-Muslim relations. And a rather from Muslim man came up to me and said, are you the chief rabbi? I said, yes. He said, my wife wants a word with you. And I was dreading what she was going to say, and she came up to me with a big hijab. And she said, chief rabbi, I just want to thank you for your book, A Letter in the Scroll. Now, I don't know if you know my book, A Letter in the Scroll. It is beginning, middle, and end, a book about Jewish pride. And yet a very religious Muslim lady comes back up to me and says, thank you for writing that book. 
And I suddenly realized that faith is like a candle. And when you light that candle, it lights up the world, not just for you alone. And I suddenly realized that we have, if, we, if we have the courage of our difference and walk the talk and go out as proud Jews and clearly speaking as Jews, then everyone is moved by that. Of course, it wasn't the only thing we did in Jewish continuity. The most important one in Britain was that we committed ourselves to increase and intensify Jewish education. When I became chief rabbi 21 years ago, 25% of Jewish children attended Jewish day schools. Today, 70%. Of course, we did something else as well. We got the government to pay for it, but that's another story. <laughs> The end result was that having declined demographically year on year for 60 years, in 2005, we turned the corner. And since then, the Jewish community in Britain has been growing, not through any immigration, just by birth rates. More people are getting born, fewer people are getting die, uh, dying. Somebody, somebody once asked one of my predecessors, how long did chief rabbis serve? And he replied, Chief rabbis never retire and only very rarely die. <laughs> so, you know, everyone's taking that example, and Baruch Hashem, we're growing. So, and of course, the end result of taking Judaism in the public domain and letting a Jewish voice be widely heard begins to impact on the whole environment in which Jews live because non-Jews turn out to respect and have enormous admiration for Judaism. What do they respect? Number one, the strength of Jewish marriages and families. Number two, our strong communities. Number three, our dedication to education and the life of the mind. Number four, our commitment to tzedakah and social justice. And number five, believe it or not, I tell you this, one of the stranger experiences in my life, Elena and I, I were in Amritsar in North India with the Dalai Lama and many Hindus and Sikhs, and we heard a Sikh from Britain get up and address 2,000 Sikhs. Amritsar is the Jerusalem of the Sikhs, the place of the Golden Temple, and he says to 2,000 Sikhs, you know, friends, what we Sikhs need, we need what the Jews have, it's called Shabbos. He said, you wouldn't believe this thing. The whole day when they do nothing but spend time with their family and friends, I thought I'd get him to give that drush in all our shuls. It was absolutely tremendous. So when non-Jews respect, uh, and this is what I discovered. After 21 years, I discovered that non-Jews respect Jews who respect Judaism. And that was a very, very powerful message. So I hope I've shown that if we think carefully and really go back to asking why we are Jews, we will win allies in the fight against anti-Semitism. We will resolve many, perhaps not all, but many of the tensions within the Jewish community. And we may just secure Jewish continuity if we come to wear our difference with pride. I have to say that we should have that pride throughout history. Many, many, many nations have believed in the idea of power. Jews believe in the power of ideas, of which the dignity of difference is one of the most remarkable. And through it, we, a very small people, became the voice throughout the ages for freedom, human dignity, the sanctity of life. We told the world that a nation is strong when it cares for the weak, it is rich when it cares for the poor. It is powerful when it cares for the powerless. And it only becomes invulnerable when it cares for the vulnerable. Judaism became, and I think always will be, the voice of hope in the conversation of humankind. And so I end really with one very simple story. It goes back 30 years long, long before I was chief rabbi. Elena and I, look, you know, we don't live in Santa Barbara, we live in London. You know what an English winter is like? I call the English weather the Almighty's Aliyah campaign. <laughs> so one very, very miserable winter, I said to Elena, let's go somewhere where there's sunshine. And we had never been to Elat before, so we said, let's go to Elat, it's hot. It's... And we mentioned this to friends, and they said, please don't go to Elat. It's not Rabonish. 
not everyone dresses to rabbinical standards of modesty. Well, we went anyway, and you know what? They were right. I spent the whole week with my glasses off, bumping into things, and uh, you know, we said, what can we do in Elat, which is rabbonish? <laughs> And we suddenly came across these glass bottom boats that they used to have, you know, um, where you can see all the wonderful tropical fish. And we went on one of these glass bottom boats, and we were the only people on the boat, and we were talking. And the captain of the boat came up to us very excitedly and said, Atamme Anglia, are you from England? We said, Yes, why do you ask? He said, Ah, I've just come from England. I've just been to a holiday in England. And we said, how do you like it? How did you like it? He said, wonderful. The buildings, so old. The grass, so green. The people, so polite. And then he looked around him. And in those days, a lot was, you know, just a desert, I have to tell you. And he looked around at these bare, barren, brown hills. And an enormous smile came over his face. And he said, Avalze Shalanu. But this is ours. Friends, there are other nations, other cultures, and other creeds, each beautiful in its own way. Avalze Shalanu. But this is ours. That is where our identity with pride. Let us always be true to our faith and a blessing to others, regardless of their faith. And we will bring blessings to the world. Thank you very much indeed. And I'd like to know, um, how you think about who is a Jew. Who is a Jew? But from but bringing us through your train of thought. Pardon? But your own personal train of thought. My own personal train of thought on who is a Jew. I think there's not one answer to that question. I think there's several. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that uh, the easiest way of thinking about it is to think in terms of a distinction between a covenant of faith and a covenant of fate. Not all Jews share a faith, but all Jews share a fate. And that is the important one. Somebody once asked, way back, you know, when the rescue of Ethiopian Jewry was about to begin. And there was a question at the time raised are the Ethiopian Jews halachically Jewish? And somebody asked that to the great halachic authority of his day, Rabbi Moshe Feinstein. And Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, and it's published in his response, are answered as follows. What kind of question is that to ask? <laughs> Here are people willing to risk their lives for the sake of their Jewish identity, and you're asking, are they Jewish? Just rescue them anyway, and then debate about whether they're Jewish or not. <laughs> so I believe that all those who choose to share in the Jewish fate are members of the covenant of fate. <clears throat> the agreement that you worked out in Great Britain was wonderful, but it stopped short. That's not your fault. It's the nature of orthodoxy, even centrist orthodoxy, an unwillingness to discuss matters of halacha, of real Jewish concern with non-Orthodox Jews. What, is the chance that, what are the chances of that breaking down? Because if you can't talk about what's most important to you, you can't talk about anything. I know that Asher Patton in New York may make a difference. I hope you'll make a difference. But um, I continue to be puzzled by the resistance of modern orthodoxy to break down the old shibboleths about the inadmissibility of discussing significant matters with non-orthodox colleagues. Uh, beloved friend, I talk about anything to anyone. 
I really do. You're talking to somebody who met, just made a half an hour television program for Rosh Hashanah uh, in conversation with Richard Dawkins, uh, the world's biggest atheist. And he's a total apicarist and he's not even Jewish. Just think about that. <laughs> so I talk to everyone about everything. Um, and we frequently, throughout these 21 years, have had quiet, behind-the-scenes conversations on anything that the non-Orthodox rabbinate, that Jewish gays and lesbians, that all sorts of groups, they've come around, we've been totally open, and we always are, and people know that we always are. Don't think that I can do miracles. I am a chief rabbi, I am a defender of the faith, I am Mr. Establishment. And there's just so much I can do in public and so much that I can't do in public. But I think people fully realize, because we're a community that, that knows what happens uh, quietly, knows that there are real friendships in Britain between myself and the non-Orthodox rabbinate, between myself and fa famous secular and atheist Jews. They know I'm not afraid to discuss anything with anyone. And to a certain extent, I would ask for your sympathy here. You know, the rabbi said, Ein habracha shora ela al dawa samui min ayin. Very, very often, blessings only rest on things that are not brought out into the public view. And that ac applies across the board. There are certain relations that I have with British politicians or religious leaders or so on, which are just quiet, but people know they're there. And they know that there's a direct line of communication between us and them. So every reform and liberal and conservative rabbi in Britain knows that if they want to come around and discuss something with me, they discuss it with me. And I've never said no to any group whatsoever. And those moments can be moments of epiphany. You know, a willingness to listen to somebody else, a willingness to reach out to somebody else carries its own blessing. And I hope that what that that is at least, as they say, uh, a little consolation. We can do much by way of friendship that we can't always do formally and publicly. Maybe you can do more in America because, Baruch Hashem, you haven't got a chief rabbi, so you can relax. <laughs> at any rate, I think that you provide a shining example here in Santa Barbara in ways in which all sorts of people from all sorts of different spec places in the Jewish spectrum meet and are friends with one another. And maybe the day will come, b'mhera b'yamenu, when kol Yisrael achaverim, all Jews are friends. Amen. Thank you.